There we are. Can you see the screen now? Oh my God, that's an older photo. <laughs> oh, there you go. Let me bring that down here. <laughs> All right, so we'll make a start. Um, welcome along to the coaching corner. Um, we're back in the office and training again. We've been running on generator all week, um, but it has been fun and it's so good to get back to face-to-face -to -face teaching. Tonight's uh, coaching corner, we're uh, talking with Alan Whitehead and he's going to be talking about how to reduce x-rays um, you know, using POCUS and how to reduce your x-ray ordering using POCUS. And so now I'm going to hand over to Alan to um, talk you through a few cases. Okay, thanks, Sue Ann. Oops, just verbal practice. There you go. Okay, so uh, my contact details are on the first slide. Happy to answer any questions uh, later. I thought rather than sort of going on a particular system or a type of scan, might be just broaden it out to you know, how can we use POCUS in our clinical practice in general? I think we order too many x-rays and, you know, I'm not, it's not all about POCUS, but um, I think we can use POCUS to reduce our x-ray ordering. I'm not going to get started on ordering too many CTs, but I think if you're looking at a place to start there, there's um, some good stuff from AIUM about um, ultrasound first articles, including on the websites. Um, and uh, like renal colic would be a great one to start. They were ordering too, too many, way too many CTKUBs in premenopausal females with cumulative radiation effects, in my opinion. Um, so I think that would be a nice one to start with uh, if you're looking to reduce your CT ordering. Uh, and I think I probably see too many CT abdo pelvises when the most likely diagnosis is, gall is biliary disease and I'm sure most of you are aware that, that it, it's a suboptimal test for biliary disease. And if you really wanna answer that question, that's your most likely problem. You should be ordering an ultrasound rather than CT, obviously in a fasted patient when you wanna look at the gallbladder. So, but let's just talk about x-rays. Get on to, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about just a few, hopefully non-controversial areas where we could use, well, use ultrasound to diminish the number of x-rays or, or replace x-rays. I could get into some more controversial areas, but I think I could find enough areas that aren't controversial that we can we can achieve our aim. Uh, slides. Why oh, my slide frozen? One second down. Oh, that's interesting. My slide, my slide. Oh, hang on, I'll try this one. There we go. Okay, so I'll give you some ideas of where we could look at to reduce our x-ray ordering and supplant with um, ultrasound. And I'll illustrate that with some cases that I've seen. But first, you know, what? let's ask ourselves, well, if we're gonna do this thing, there's no point, you know, picking out the rare situation where we're gonna order an x-ray. We wanna target commonly ordered x-rays, commonly or common situations where that's happening. So chest x-ray is probably the, you know, a, a, a really big area and the other one is bones. And, and so, you know, that's probably where we should be concentrating in terms of diagnostics. And also I think procedures, there's a lot of x-rays that are ordered to confirm, you know, procedural locations of lines and um, tubes. And uh, again, or looking for complications of needles being inserted. And again, we can use ultrasound in place of, of the traditional X-ray. So let's have a look at some of these examples. Um, and, and so as per this slide, when we're talking about chest X-ray, we're talking about the non-trauma situations. We're also talking about the chest trauma situations, well known for the E part of EFAST. Uh, we're talking about fracture identification and exclusion and really sternum is just like such a, a, an easy and great example for that. Dislocation, relocation, really talking about the shoulder uh, and those post-procedural applications. So um, probably should have taken these slides out, but it was just a trigger in my mind about what I wanted to show you. So uh, the first case of like an X-ray versus you know, an echo and a lung ultrasound. So case one, 
now this this patient turned out to have a p um sorry turned out was thought to have a pe in the end it wasn't a pe but you can you'll you'll see why they thought it was the pe and it was a 73 year old female had the best story ever for pe but it shows you how unreliable histories can be she was a good historian the story was fantastic but the story was wrong as in it led you down the wrong path but great story for PE you wouldn't get better you could never get better two long bus rides two weeks earlier left calf pain shortness of breath pleuritic chest pain um no no fever hypoxic on air um tachycardic had calf tenderness. So look, what a story, you know, physical exam supporting it gets even better. Actually had ultrasound of the left lower limb done while she was a patient in the ED because they didn't want to do a CTPA because of the poor renal function. So she actually had an ultrasound which showed a DVT. What, can't get any better for this being a PE. She was given Clexane. My registrar just started teaching her lung and cardiac ultrasound. We did the, the echo, um, I'm not showing that in this case, the echo was actually normal, um, but she started doing the lung and she was concerned about what she was seeing in the lung. The patient had already had a chest X-ray, which you know showed, showed um, and had, was report, uh, hadn't been reported, was subsequently reported as a right basal effusion, some atelectasis, some mid-zone infiltrates. Um, you know, we saw the same thing as basal opacities. You know, it could have been anything, could have been pneumonia, could have been edema, could have been fibrosis, could have been anything, but certainly wasn't inconsistent. Was Well, you could get those findings with PE. So it wasn't inconsistent with PE. Um, everything pointed to it being PE, except the lung ultrasound. So this is what the lung ultrasound looked like. And you can see what really concerned us was so we're in the right upper quadrant, right lung base coming from the sort of the mid axillary line laterally. Here's the diaphragm, the grainy liver. You can see there's a bit of fluid between the liver and the diaphragm. So she had a small amount of ascites. But what concerned us is there's this swirling plankton. Like it's, it's almost, it's, it's thick. It's almost like Frank Puss swirling in the chest. Now that struck us as very odd for, for pulmonary embolism. You know, uh, it did, you know, we're thinking this, this, why would you get Frank pus with, with PE? And then we started to think, no, 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 this doesn't seem right. This, this, maybe this is pneumonia after all. So we gave her antibiotics purely on that. And that's the whole thing that changed our mind. She had poor um, gas exchange, poor renal function. You know, her obs were not great. Her blood pressure, you know, was holding, but everything else wasn't fantastic. Gas exchange was, was pretty bad. And we're in a small hospital without a HD or ICU. So we actually got her out because we were worried she was going to deteriorate. I mean, she had frank pus in the chest. There's no reason to expect she's not going to deteriorate with a pneumonia. And she actually went to the other hospital and within four hours, she deteriorated, had a met call on the ward and was in HDU on inotropes. So, you know, but that was predictable when you look at that lung ultrasound and her OBS. And she actually, they ended up doing a CTPA at the other hospital. They sort of risked the renal function. And guess what? It showed that she had pneumonia. There was no PE, but the story was absolutely the best you could ever hope for for PE. And you would have been treating the wrong thing and she may not have survived. We gave her antibiotics. She turned the corner in HDU, but you know, it was a near miss probably. And the lung ultrasound saved the day, to be honest. She had a pleural tap performed. I couldn't find out the result at the other hospital. So let's have a look at a shorter breath case. Again, you know, X-ray versus echo. So um, this was a 57 year old male, very recent, hot off the press, this case. Uh, and um, he had been in the hot section, hot ED. We separated our ED recently into a hot ED uh, and a cold ED, it basically physically separate buildings. And he'd been in the hot ED, the, the COVID suspect, you know, ED for last three, for three or four hours um, before I found out about him because I was in charge in the cold ED. 
And uh, he'd been brought in by ambulance, short of breath, hypothermia. That's that's the only story. I'm only giving you what I found that like I'm giving you what I was told at the time. So so you're coming in as as my set of eyes. I'm not giving you all the background information because I didn't have all the background information. And this patient deteriorated. So he was diagnosed by the doctor in charge of the hot ED as a cold sepsis because of the hypothermia, because of mild respiratory distress. Although his OBS were not too bad, he had a, a, a sort of a borderline slight sinus tachycardia, but his, his SATs and his blood pressure were okay. However, the lactate was concerning. It was 11 or 12, and it, he had IV fluids. He had IV antibiotics. And over several hours, the lactate wasn't coming down, but his OBS were sort of holding. And he, he was fully conscious, fully oriented, uh, sitting up talking. He'd been discussed after several hours uh, with the admitting general physician on the ward. He'd had a chest X-ray done, which didn't show any, the, the lungs look pretty clear. So they weren't quite sure where the sepsis was coming from, their presumptive diagnosis. Um, but the, uh, certainly the X-ray had a large heart. So there was a concern about maybe did he have endocarditis or maybe did he have a pericardial effusion? Um, and I was in a cold ED and I was the only doctor on in our hospital at the time who could do echo. We don't have an echo um, inpatient or ED service. We just have a visiting echo um, service one day a week. Uh, and this was a weekend, so they weren't there. Um, and, uh, and we have echo techs that come privately to the area, but again, just a week, a sort of a weekday um, intermittent service. So um, I, I, I was still finishing up what I was doing in the cold ED. And I said, once I've uh, done that, finished writing a, quite a set, few sets of notes, I'll head over before I go home and have a look at this patient. Please do not admit them to the inpatient ward because with a lactate of 12, I was worried that if it's sepsis, they could easily deteriorate. And I wanted them to stay in the ED ED longer on fluids and antibiotics and observation and get my okay to go to the ward. So they did that. And like I was within about two sentences of writing my last set of notes about the, the two hour mark after they originally called. And then I got another desperate call from the nursing staff saying that the patient was deteriorating rapidly, was some sort of altered conscious state, was frothing at the mouth. I needed to come over urgently. So I dropped my things, ran, ran sort of over, it took me two or three minutes to get there. And by that stage, they were doing CPR on the patient. So that's basically, you know, how I, I came into it. And I didn't see this X-ray until after the fact, but this is the one that they were concerned about. Um, this is the actual X-ray. And you can see that heart is quite big and does have a bit of a globular sort of appearance uh, with sort of clear lung fields. Can everyone see that? Yep. So, um, but I didn't... I didn't um, have that x-ray. I didn't have the ECG or anything else in front of me. I was just walking into a cardiac arrest um, with, you know, what's going on. Maybe it's a pericardial effusion. Maybe it's something else. Um, and, uh, yeah, so so he had various rhythms. He was in asystole initially. Then he was in pulseless VT. He was in AFib without an output. You know, so my aim was, you know, really within, you know, the first two or three minutes after I got there to get the ultrasound on his heart and actually see what's going on. So this is actually the first view that I got. Now it's not a clip, it's a still, because for some reason the clip didn't actually record properly, but I managed to salvage the still in the first second. Um, but I think it still tells you some useful um, information of what I saw. This is subcostal cardiac. And so I'm shooting through the liver here, um, that subcostal four chamber view. And I'm thinking, oh, this looks a bit odd, you know, Where's the heart? Which is the heart? If this is the heart, you know, if, if this is the heart, then how come it's going all the way across the screen? You know, it just does not look like the right ventricle. It's going all the way across. So like, nah, that could be fluid. And this could be the heart sitting under here. And when I was moving with a clip, you know, I was thinking 50-50. Nah, uh, yeah, I think it could be, but I want to get some more views. So this is the next view I got. And this is a clip. This is the parasternal long. And just bear with me for a second. And now you can see here's the apex out here and there's a lot of fluid surrounding that heart. And it's pretty obvious. There's some cardiac activity happening. So this guy's got pseudo PEA. He should, you know, um, there's a potential to get a cardiac output here, but really um, nothing, was, nothing was happening. But, you know, potentially salvageable, he's got tamponade until proven otherwise. And he had, you know, a good several centimeters of um, thickness of fluid. So the next object is obviously to get a catheter or needle in there and drain that fluid. 
first attempt, I didn't get much, but I um, repositioned. Um, uh, Apical attempt both times, second time. Um, I knew it was tamponade. I was just trying to work out at this stage, you know, where's my best spot. And um, so I came over from the parasternal view to the apical view, as I said. And again, you know, good several centimeters of fluids that are sitting around the apex of the heart here. I was pretty happy I had a pretty big target to hit. Um, first attempt didn't, didn't quite get it, but second attempt um, got, got fluid out. Um, this is just before I was about to do the second attempt. And you can see this sort of, even the left ventricular wall looks like it's collapsing a bit here and the left atrial wall is collapsing a bit. Uh, but we knew it was, you know, tamponade, the guy's arrested and, you know, um, and he's got a thick pericardial effusion, certainly, you know, more than two centimetres, probably, you know, four centimetres. So, uh, uh, you know, gross pericardial effusion. So um, I got out 200 mils of frank blood just with the longest catheter I could find. We couldn't find any uh, long catheters. We just moved, se separated, and, and we just couldn't find it. Um, so I didn't have a, a, a pigtail catheter or a... I didn't, didn't, I thought about afterwards, maybe a central line, but you know, the lumens are very small and the triple lumen central line, it would have taken quite a while to suck out 200 mils of blood. Um, so we just got the longest catheter we could get, which was five centimeters. I think it was a, a, a 14 gauge, five centimeter catheter um, and, and stuck that in and got easily four, four syringes, 50 mils of blood. Um, and then the output came back. Um, and then I thought, uh, what I want to do after I did that was I wanted, and you can see there's a lot less blood now after I've, you know, taken that out. There's still, there's, sorry, there's still blood or fluid, but there's visually, it's not as much. It's probably at least half. And then I, what I wanted to do was try and work out why has he got this blood, you know, this hemopericardium. So I was trying to work out whether there was an aortic dissection. But this guy, the history was he'd been sort of unwell for several days. If it was a type aortic dissection, he would have been dead by well before then because there's 100% mortality at 24 to 48 hours. So I didn't think it was going to be that, but I thought I'd look anyway. I couldn't see a dilated aortic root. I couldn't see a flap in the parasternal long. And then I thought, um, so that's what I was trying to do. I, I swung actually from a subcostal window to this parasternal window. So if you're wondering why it looks like it's changing, I went from a subcostal window and I just moved the probe. I didn't actually... I didn't actually, you know, um, do two separate clips. So here's the subcostal, and you can see that fluid's a lot less than that first still picture. Um, and there's some nice cardiac activity happening. And then I just moved the probe up to capture the parasternal long. And then I thought, why don't I look at the aorta, abdominal aorta, and see if I can see a flap there. So I had a look at the abdominal aorta. There was no flap or in a transverse plane there. And I was happy there was no flap in that abdominal aorta. And I also went into long for trans into long diving down behind the heart and again uh, deep to the liver no flap visible uh, and um so um then back to subcutaneous four and I, I looked at the ivc and again another another view after that of the ivc then the aorta just to again double check that there's no flap there there's there's the ivc and then the aorta just another plane um, and I was pretty happy, not a great view, but I was pretty happy there was no flap there. And so things were looking quite good. You know, look at that, you know, a lot of that fluid's gone. Pretty, pretty good, you know, reduction in that bloody fluid or blood. And, you know, pretty good squeeze, every, you know, looking more like a normal heart. There's output. Um, but then things just deteriorated from there. Um, and, uh, you know, we could, we could never sustain an output. And so after about an hour, we stopped. Um, I thought maybe a myocardial rupture, but he had a normal ECG and they never did a troponin. Um, and maybe, or maybe it was malignancy with a, with a, um, grossly bloodstained, um, pericardial effusion, but it, to me, it looked like Frank blood, but it wasn't clotted. And, um, and the ultrasound didn't look like clotted blood either. So, we, you know, we, it wasn't a coroner's case in the end. Um, we called it myocardial rupture, but you know, we don't know exactly what it was in the end. Um, so another one of x-ray versus ultrasound. Um, so this one was a patient that was referred for a tap by a GP. And I have a few examples of this coming up. This is one I like to say very, very personally, I would strongly advise not doing taps on the basis of a chest x-ray. I just think it's too risky. Now, if you're in a place where you don't have a modality other than x-ray, 
you, you may have choice, but the fact that you're listening to this talk probably tells me you have access to ultrasound. I would 100% check what you've got with the ultrasound. Don't rely on the x-ray. It's not the x-ray's fault. It's the limit of the, of the physics. You know, it hits, it hits stuff that looks what goes white and then the plate, but it doesn't know what it's hitting. It could be, you know, it could be tumor. It could be, you know, uh, very consolidated lung with a little bit of fluid around it. It could be anything. It doesn't. And even if it is fluid around the lung in a pleural cavity, you can't tell how much fluid is actually there. It could be half a centimeter thick. It could be eight centimeters thick. There's just no way of knowing. It's too risky. And hopefully these cases, two or three cases will show you how risky it actually is. So this patient was referred in by a GP with a known left pleural effusion reported on a chest X-ray that they'd um, they'd um, seen as an outpatient. The X-ray had actually been ordered by the cardiologist who um, was also involved with this patient. And, and reason I've seen the cardiologist was that had recent shortness of breath, only on exertion, not at rest. This lady was not in distress. Her stats were good, her respiratory rate was normal. So she saw the cardiologist a few days earlier. They ordered an X-ray, but the GP was the one that followed up the X-ray because they didn't see the cardiologist again for a while. And then the X-ray was reported as a moderate to large pleural effusion. And therefore they were sent to the ED for a tap because it there's in our area, there's no other way for the for the patient to get a tap. You know, we don't have um uh, radiologists on site most of the time that can do that. Um, it's all teleradiology. Uh, and so, you know, uh, and most GPs don't do taps. So they actually send to the ED for us to do the taps. But, um, you know, this one, certainly there wasn't a striking clinical urgency to it. Um, but uh, the consultant on in ED thought, okay, I'll, I'll do it anyway. Um, and uh, she put an ultrasound probe on as she should have. And, and then she saw something she didn't like. And then I was around, so she asked me for a second opinion. And, um, but the background of patient that we found out subsequently was that they'd been losing weight for a, quite a few months, quite a lot of weight. And she'd worked in an asbestos factory as a young adult. Um, her bloods were unremarkable. There'd been no chest pain or cough. And the plan was that we were asked to uh, tap her lung, her left, pleural effusion and then admit her under um, the GP or physician to the ward and then refer her on to a, a respiratory physician or thoracic surgeon. So the, as I said, the day consultant was in the process of about to do the tap, had, had got the ultrasound, was about marking the spot. This was actually the x-rays that had been done a few days earlier that had been reported as a moderate to large left pleural effusion. I can buy that. I'd probably say it's overstating it to call it large on this x-ray, but it's only moderate. Um, that's what it looks like, but again, could be anything. So let's have a look at what the ultrasound showed. Well, okay, this ain't straightforward. Here's a still picture in the uh, left lung base. And there's something weird going on here, a big sort of solid mass and some fluid around it. This is a still picture and there's a centimeter marks on the side. So you can see it's sort of looking like a grapefruit sized sitting in the left lung base area and another still, and it's merging with the spleen, you know, the diaphragm, it's all sort of, you know, where's it coming from? Is it coming from the diaphragm? Is it infiltrating a diaphragm? I mean, you can virtually see no separation between the spleen and this mass. And there's some fluid again in front of it. And it's quite big, you know, these, are, these, these markers are on sort of the outside rim of it, nine centimeters, you know, good grapefruit size. Pictures worth a thousand words, clips even better. You know, so here's the mass moving above the mass. You can see all these little strands flicking off it. There's fluid around it moving up towards the, you know, more, more um, towards the cephalid side, towards the head. Um, and there's a bit of fluid sitting above it. And there's a heart at the back. <laughs> Don't stick the needle in too far. You might hit the heart. And again, another clip. And uh, you can see it's sort of like, you know, it's really sort of, you know, right up against the diaphragm. And where, where is the diaphragm? It's all distorted. There's a heart at the back. And um, some consolidated lung, a little bit of fluid around it. Not, not a lot of fluid. And there was one other bit. Yeah. And you can also see these lumps coming off the diaphragm, little polypy lumps which is sort of making it think like, oh, this looks like, you know, mesothelioma, you know, cause you've got these sort of polyps coming, 
maybe off the pleural lining and you've got a big one that's grown out, but you've got a couple of small little children. So uh, here's a CT, you know, um, and you know, uh, you know, the mass is sitting in here. You can see it on the coronal plane, you know, this big mass sitting on top of, on top of the spleen, you know, and you know, where's it coming from? Could be a rhabdomyosarcoma from the diaphragm as well. That's possible. But, you know, given those polyps that we saw, um, the strong suspicion is this is, and a history of asbestos exposure. The, the feeling is this is going to turn out to be mesothelioma. I don't know what the ultimate diagnosis was. I didn't get to chase it as far as a tissue diagnosis and biopsy because that's what she would have. We sent her home. We weren't going to stick a needle anywhere near this. And what she needs is, is a needle into that mass guided to work out what the cause is. But if someone hadn't put the ultrasound on, that a needle would have been stuck in and potentially you know, done damage. And even if you don't really want to stick a needle blindly into a tumor anywhere, because you can spread it, you know, um, they're highly vascular structures. So one example of not why, why you just don't um, uh, put needles into the chest on the basis of a chest X-ray. Here's another example. So this was a, 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 an elderly man with shortness of breath for a couple of weeks, uh, slowly getting worse, but again, not, not short of breath at rest, not distressed, normal obs, and um, he just sort of self-presented. Uh, and let's have a look at the chest X-ray. So this is his actual chest X-ray. Interesting sort of chest X-ray in that it looks like it's only affecting like the lateral half of the left lung. So it's quite sort of like loculated or got a border, which is interesting. It was officially reported as a large left pleural effusion with some pleural thickening. That was the official report. Again, nothing wrong with that. I can buy that report. It just shows the limitation of x-ray. Um, and so what happened was um, the medical people had already seen it before I even knew about this patient uh, in the ED. And the MedRidge came up to me and said, oh, we want to admit him to investigate this loculated pleural effusion, large pleural effusion. Um, Again, we're in a hospital that doesn't have any um, radiologists on site, it's all um, teleradiology. So Alan, do you mind doing a diagnostic tap? Now, uh, diagnostic taps always worry me because it means there's less margin of safety. When it's therapeutic, you know, they've got big volumes and you're actually trying to relieve their hypoxia or their respiratory distress. You, you know, the margin of safety is much better. So diagnostic taps, by definition, smaller amount of fluid, you know, um, not doing it to relieve distress, a uh, bit, bit more risky. Certainly, um, you know, I would be very reluctant for my registrars or trainees to do a diagnostic pleural tap or a diagnostic acidic tap. They should be just doing the ones that are big volume. Uh, and Daniel Lichtenstein, the godfather of lung ultra, and that sound actually says in ICU setting, he would say he would, and he's been, he's done hundreds, I'm sure, of pleural taps on his patients. And he's a lung ultrasound sort of godfather. He said, you know, if it's under two centimeters thick, I wouldn't touch it myself. It's too risky. If it's two to six centimeters, it should be in expert hands, someone who's experienced doing it, like myself or someone else who's done a lot. And if it's greater than six centimeters in depth, anyone pretty much can do it as long as, you know, they've been shown how to do a few. Um, so, uh, you know, diagnostic taps are risky. Uh, now, then I put the ultrasound on. And I said, first I said the reg, I don't do diagnostic, I'm not doing any tap. I do diagnostic taps. I, I'm not that keen on it because I think it's not ED's role. Um, so, but if I'm not doing anything, I'm not busy, I'll do it. But otherwise I've got other things that are more urgent. I'll do therapeutic taps and I'll do diagnostic if I'm not busy. Um, so I said, but I don't stick any needles into the chest on the basis of chest x-rays. I'm sorry. They either need a CT or an ultrasound. So let's look, put the ultrasound on and have a look. So when I put the ultrasound on, I was in the left lung base area using the linear probe at this stage. There's the rib. There's another rib. There's the pleural line to Daniel Lichtenstein's bat swing. And you can see there's some sort of lumpy, bumpy thing underneath. And these are centimeter marks on the side. So there's not a lot of fluid, you know, to the top of this lumpy, bumpy thing is only about half a centimeter. And it's about two centimeters to the bottom. So I could easily prang what that is. I said, again, I said, I'm not sticking a needle anywhere near this. I don't know what it is yet, but a needle's not going in. And then I thought, let's interrogate it with the uh, curvy linear probe, get a bit more depth and work out what's going on in deeper structures. And again, the rib shadows at the top here, I haven't moved, I've just changed the probe. 
And I'm still getting this sort of lumpy, bumpy effect. And it almost looks like cobblestone sort of appearance, you know, here of tissue. I think, what is this thing? You know, there's not a lot of fluid. Look at the sliver of fluid there. You know, the needle would go straight into this tissue, whatever it is. Thinking, is this like a mesothelioma? Because it's really irregular, you know. And then I look at the patient. My very efficient intern who'd got the med reg had failed to actually note that the patient had a big scar in the lower chest, in the midline and the upper abdomen. I thought, what is this scar? Because he'd never mentioned it to me when he presented the history. Um, and I asked the patient, he had a esophagectomy 18 months ago for esophageal cancer. Okay, point number one. And the second thing is I looked, I found an old x-ray on the system from our sister hospital six months ago, and it was completely normal. So this was a mesothelioma that didn't fit because it's just come out of nowhere in six months. So you know what this turned out to be? A massive diaphragmatic hernia, and you know, which is from that esophagectomy because they cut through the diaphragm when they're operating and that causes a, a scar, which then weakens, can weaken over time and it allowed all the abdominal contents to come up in the chest. So this is all abdominal contents. This is actually the villus, you know, uh, not the, uh, what do you call it? The epiploca, the little sort of fat, uh, blobs that sit on the outside of the bowel. Um, that's what we were seeing. And actually in the CT scan, it showed that everything that could move in his abdomen was in his chest, including half the pancreas. There was nothing left in his abdomen that, apart from you know kidneys and aorta and stuff that couldn't move. Um, uh, and again, a dangerous situation. If you put a needle in there blindly, you could easily perforate the bowel and cause a, a, you know, a mediastinitis. Um, uh, page down. Okay. So hopefully that's another example of not putting needles into chests on the basis of chest x-rays. Nothing wrong with the report, nothing wrong with the interpretation. It's the limit of the chest x-ray. Um, another case, um, this one, a uh, 96-year-old man presented by ambulance, just feeling vaguely unwell for a week. He'd been discharged a month earlier. His only uh, OBS abnormality was fever. Otherwise, he looked pretty well. He was unkempt, but his OBS were totally normal. Had a chest X-ray done. This is the actual X-ray. So I'm trying to always show you what the actual X-rays were by comparison. Now, we were talk, talk about this in medical school. This is a whiteout of the left lung. Um, and that means it's either a massive pleural effusion or it's a totally collapsed um, consolidated left lung, usually from sort of um, uh, mucus plug and, and pus and gunk uh, blocking the main bronchus on the left side. Um, you try to then, according to medical school, look for the trachea and see whether it's moved across or moved away. It looks pretty midline here, so that medical school thing doesn't help. Um, and it looks like there's more solid down here and maybe a little less solid up in the apex. But again, ultrasound just shows you so much more information. So this is my GEV scan original model. I've just used my phone to take the picture. And again, a clip of ultrasound is worth a thousand words. And we're in a left lung base and we've got little like, little, like snaky worm, sorry, little worms sort of just flicking around, floating in the fluidy breeze. There's the diaphragm, there's a spleen. Now we've got a snake or a python sort of, or a whip sort of moving back and forth again in that left chest cavity with some solid tissue, lung tissue or mass or collapsed lung underneath and, and floating in that fluid. Then we've got, you know, the octopus and we've got the space invader. Now there's only really one thing that can do this. So, um, you know, this is sort of, you know, textbook example and ultrasound of empyema, which fits with a picture with a fever. Um, in, a, in a previous um, ZDU course, uh, respiratory um, uh, trainee or reg said, oh, you could get this malignancy. Uh, I've never heard of it or seen it described with malignancy, but um, I suppose it's possible. But remember this patient had fever. So, you know, this is empyema every day of the week. Um, which affects how you manage the patient. So, um, you know, I wanted to just admit this patient and palliate, you know, he's 96. He's not a healthy man. Um, there's no easy cure for this. You have to open the chest and then, and then, you know, scrape and suck all the pus out and break down all these septa. You know, these four clips just show you how many septa were there. There were probably 20, 25 septa in that left chest cavity that you'd have to break down. 
um, antibiotics aren't going to fix the problem. Um, but um, unfortunately, the admitting doctor on the ward didn't want to take the patient. So um, not much I can do. So I had to refer them to a larger hospital with respiratory. To my amazement, they accepted the patient. Um, and uh, they didn't actually do anything except, uh, what did they do? I actually, they gave them antibiotics and they did put a chest tube in. I thought, I thought that's, they said, told me that was their plan to put a chest tube in. I thought chest tube's not going to solve this problem. You've got 20, 25 septa or cavities here that need to be broken down. The chest tube's just going to sit in one cavity and drain that. And the rest of it's still going to be there. But they did what they did. They put a chest tube in. Also, I thought that was pretty risky. You could easily cause bleeding because there's so many septa. Um, they put a chest tube in, didn't get any complication, but didn't fix the problem. Uh, the patient got discharged one, uh, one or two weeks later. And then I saw him again two months later, he was still alive, came back with exactly the same presentation. We actually re-ultrasounded him and the chest ultrasound, lung ultrasound looked exactly the same as these pictures. It hadn't changed one iota. And this time, the same admitting uh, inpatient doctor agreed to accept the patient for palliation because now he finally acknowledged that it was pointless <laughs> and there wasn't anything you could do for the patient. Um, some trauma cases, um, hemoneumothorax and lung contusion, you know, ultrasound, uh, you know, trauma hospitals, trauma doctors, we've all known for, you know, 30 years that ultrasound far, far superior to x-ray. Um, this one was a person who fell off a ladder, was brought in by private car, uh, and uh, he'd had a chest x-ray already done, which showed a left lung contusion. This was within an hour of the fall, so it shows you it's pretty bad when it's already showing up on x-ray within an hour of the fall. But the doctor that was looking after him just wasn't quite sure whether it was showing a left apical pneumothorax. Maybe, maybe not. And we, again, we don't have, you know, um, surgeons at, our, at the small hospital I was at then, and we have to transfer. And you just want to know before you transfer whether there's a pneumothorax or not, because you're going to be more inclined about putting a chest tube in if you've got to stick them in an ambulance for an hour, hour and a half. So we really wanted to answer that question. So we thought, let's just go to ultrasound and try to answer that question. He'd already done the fast um, abdo component and was happy with that. Just wasn't quite sure. Wanted a second opinion on the on the lung ultrasound part of the EFAST. His OBS were normal, by the way. So it, this is a great example. They don't uh, emphasize it in, in FAST courses um, uh, as much as they should. Uh, certainly in EMST, you know, uh, uh, I think this is probably not emphasized, is it's great for lung contusion, you know, because it causes B lines. Uh, remember, B lines are caused by thickening, keeping it simple, thickening of the of the lung tissue uh, by any means, whether that's fluid, infection, scarring, but also bruising. So uh, you get B lines in lung contusion. It shows up earlier than X-ray. Shows up even earlier than CT. So we're getting great example of that lung contusion that they actually were already seeing on X-ray. Couldn't see you know, any hemothorax in the left pleural cavity, but it was hard to see because the lung curtain. But the good thing is if the lung's in the way, there can't be a lot of um, blood in that left lung cavity. But let's try and answer the question of whether there was a pneumothorax. So we went up to the left apex. Here's the bat swing with the two ribs on each side, uh, casting a shadow and a pleur in between and looking for the lung sliding. There's just no lung sliding happening in there. There's a bit of, you know, upwards movement, but no lung sliding. So we were happy, you know, on the context and with the x-ray, mm, yes, this is looking like there is a pneumothorax there. But even more convinced on the second shot, where there's actually the lung point. So you can see the lung sliding coming in, getting to about there and then going back again. And in this other part of the space, there's no lung sliding happening at all. So this is 99% positive predictive value for a pneumothorax. So we basically sealed it. This guy's got a, a small you know, left uh, pneumothorax uh, coming down to the third interspace. And we put a chest tube in. And just to seal that, if you want to demonstrate that you're smart and you want to save it for education or posterity, you can do an M mode and we can see the alternating between, you know, the stratosphere or barcode sign and the seashore sign, which proves that there's a lung point because you're alternating in that same space. And, and you can see it with an, you can see it's, it's not very fine grained, but that's because I'm using the abdo probe. I didn't even need to change the probe. I can still prove that that um, alternating barcode uh, seashore effect, even with the abdominal probe. So I didn't need to go to the linear probe, but if you're wondering why it's not that grainy, that's why, but I could still see it. Um, now let's get on to some bones. So um, really, really quickly, you know, this is the big, this is an easy win. Forget x-ray, don't even order a sternal x-ray ever again. 
That is my strongest advice. It's a waste of time. In old people, you'll never be able to tell whether there's a fracture there most of the time or not because of the degenerative changes. In young people, you're just wasting time. You can answer whether they've got a sternal ex, uh, fracture in 10 seconds rather than sending them to the radiology department. And it's actually more sensitive than X-ray. X-ray will still miss even in young people and misses more in old people. It's even more sensitive than CT, which I'll show you with a case. Okay, I think I've, um, so just reiterating those points, slide down, use a linear probe, set the frequency as high as you can, because remember it's just under the skin, start at the sternal notch, probe marker to the head, and just slide down till you get to the zippy sternum in the midline. You should be able to do it in 10 seconds, and you'll spot, spot the step um, or the break in the cortex of the sternum straight away. Often there's a little bit of a hematoma sitting over the top like there is with any fractures when you're looking with ultrasound. Now, um, when I said that even CT is not as good as ultrasound, there was a patient that had fallen over, elderly patient, she was around 90, she was put in short stay and she was in a lot of pain, couldn't move. And I, I didn't see her initially when she came into the ED, but I came to see her the next morning. And I said, uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Smith, where, where's, where, where's it hurting? She goes, she just pointed to this spot only in the sternum and said, it's just so sore. There, everything else is fine, just right in that spot. She'd had a pan CT scan ordered the evening before, totally normal. I looked at the films, couldn't see anything either. Reported, officially reported as normal. Again, nothing wrong with the report. That's what it showed. This is the limitation of CT. But there's the fracture. You don't need to have good eyes to spot that fracture. All right? Missed by the CT. Why? Because people forget CT is a slicer. It slices like a it slices a carrot, right? It's not continuous. Even the new ones are two millimeter slices. So if you're unlucky enough to have your fracture fall between the slices, the CT cannot on physical properties see it. And therefore it makes it, remember between the slices, it's basically joined the dots. It's, it's imaginary. It's, it's, it's not there what it's seeing. It just smooths the picture. It's, it's, it's making it up. So, so when it doesn't look like there's a fracture there, that's because it's, it's just dead space, the CT, and it just sort of joins the dots. But the fracture was there, but it fell between the slices. Please do a ultrasound, even if the CT is normal, and forget doing x-rays. And if you see a fracture, guess what? Go on, look at the heart, look for a pericardial, a hemopericardium. Look to see how well the, how well the LV is squeezing probably should look at the lungs and make sure there's no lung contusion, um, hemothorax, pneumothorax, especially if it's a major mechanism. And most sternal fractures, by definition, to break the sternum are significant force. Um, but you can also use it for joints. Here's an example of a normal uh, right sternoclavicular joint. Uh, you can see it's level, but you could use this if you're worried about a, a sternoclavicular joint dislocation because it perce ultrasound perceives depth. You can't actually achieve this with a X-ray. There is no way you can actually tell whether a sternoclavicular joint is dislocated or subluxed with an X-ray because you can't get the angle of the X-ray to be able to perceive that. You'd have to do a CT. You don't really want to be doing CTs on teenagers of their chest unless you really have to. An ultrasound gives you an alternative that's not radiation. Um, and uh, I haven't seen any yet, but it, it, it should work. I've seen some proximal clavicle sort of head fractures that are really close to the sternoclavicular joint that I've been able to see. Rib fractures, there's a lot of description in the literature about rib fractures. I don't do them. I'm not saying you shouldn't or you can't because they're well described. I just do find that um, they take a bit of time to find, even though they say that, you know, the patient should point to the spot that's sore, but often they, they're not as pinpoint where they're pointing as you'd like, you know, it's sort of like it's vaguely to that area, right? And then you're searching, searching. And the other thing is, it's like when we did, when we did order x-rays, is, you know, what's the point really? I want to know, is there a complication? I want to know, is there a hemothorax and hemothorax or lung contusion? That's really what I'm interested in. I'm not so interested in whether there's rib fractures or not, because it doesn't change my management. Um, and, um, but I did actually find just recently, I, I didn't save the pictures, unfortunately, um, but I did demonstrate a fourth right sternal chondral subluxation in a teenage autistic boy. So we didn't actually have a history of trauma, but obviously he'd had some trauma, but he just couldn't communicate it well. And his parents didn't see it happen. And it had pain in this sort of area right about sort of here for three or four days. It 
you, you could tell he was distressed. His mother could tell he was distressed. He was pointing to the area. Um, I thought, well, you know, and I, he got sent by um, urgent care center for an x-ray. I said, no, 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 don't x-ray him. Let's just do an ultrasound here in the consulting room, right? Uh, and, um, and we could actually see a, 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 a subluxation and a malalignment between the sternum and, and the costal cartilage at that uh, fourth uh, rib level, uh, which is managed conservatively, just like you manage uh, rib fractures uh, conservatively. Um, so, I, you know, they were happy they had a diagnosis. You could actually see a little hematoma um, over the, the sternochondral subluxation as well. And they had a diagnosis. Um, shoulders, um, there's a separate ZDU talk that's recorded, uh, which we've done, you know, a whole session on shoulder dislocation, including intraarticular injection to numb the shoulder before you reduce it. I would definitely, not controversial by, by saying, definitely use it for spontaneous dislocation. Some people might be a bit reluctant to do it for tra traumatic dislocations because of the, you know, there may be a fracture. Um, but the studies have shown that in young shoulders, ultrasound is as good as an X-ray in picking whether there's a fracture in the humeral neck head area. It's just in older people, you know, your accuracy of that drops by about 20%. You get 20% false positives and false negatives combined because of the degenerative change. So sometimes the degenerative change in the old shoulder can look like a fracture and you overcall it, or it can hide the fracture and you miss the fracture. So, but again, you know, um, even if the shoulder is fractured, if it's dislocated as well, which is really, really rare, in 30 years, I've only seen one combined uh, shoulder dislocation with a neck of humerus fracture in the same patient in the same shoulder. So it's really, really rare. And even, th even then, in theory, the capsule is intact and you still have to try to reduce the shoulder and it, you can still pull on it. But you know, if you're a bit nervous about the fracture thing, then at least use it for spontaneous dislocations. There's no need for an X-ray. You can prove it's out or in with the ultrasound. And then even in the traumatic ones, once you've done the, you think you've done the reduction, prove it's back in. Now, if they're skinny, you know, um, you know, you can usually tell where it's in, but we all have those patients where they're large shouldered or they're obese. It's really hard to tell where the shoulder's back in and you don't get a good clunk and you're just not sure. And it's like reducing a wrist fracture where the wrist is very swollen or they've got a large wrist. And it's really embarrassing to wake the patient up and then realize that the shoulder's still out. You know, um, you don't want to be in that situation because then you have to do a redo and it's, it's unfortunate. So, if you're not clinically certain that it's back in, have the ultrasound there to prove that it's, it's back in. Um, I think I've pretty much covered all of those things I wanted to say there. Um, I've covered all of that. Um, and it, in older people, sometimes you're not sure, is the shoulder subluxed? It's sort of borderline out, you know. Usually they should line up by about a, uh, a centimetre. Um, I'll show you a couple of pictures, but as I said, we've got a whole recorded talk on the ZDU uh, website. I'm sure Sue Ann will explain at the end how to access that or Coach's Corner. Um, uh, but in old, sometimes in old patients, they've got sublux sort of shoulders, and you might not be certain whether it's out or in compared to the asymptomatic side. Because if it's the same on the other side, like most things with MSK, you can be pretty confident you don't have a problem. And the other thing is also it's dynamic. That's a great thing about ultrasound versus MRI or CT is you can actually watch the joint moving in real time while the ultrasound's there and see how it's articulating with the glenoid fossa. And if it's articulating with the glenoid fossa well, then, you know, again, that gives you confidence that it's actually in. So um, a couple of quick pictures. Here's, um, uh, again, I don't have the time to go into the theory. That's not the point of this talk, but um, posterior approach to the shoulder. Uh, these are anterior dislocations. Posterior approach to the shoulder. This is the right shoulder where I've got um, I've got the glenoid here. It looks like an S or a C, and then the humeral head sort of sitting down here. And here's all the space where the center of the head used to be. Now I've done my reduction. So this is out. This is um, anteriorly dislocated because my probe's coming from posterior, so it's further away from the probe. It's moved um, anteriorly or away from the probe because I've got my probe placed posteriorly. And now I've reduced it, and now you can see it's it's much better aligned. There's the humeral head, there's the glenoid. It should be within a centimeter either way of that sort of top of the glenoid, either that way or that way, in that sort of centimeter range. Usually it will be slightly post normal shoulder will be slightly posteriorly placed the head of the humerus compared to the glenoid. 
but it varies from patient to patient. Most people are around about half a centimetre posteriorly placed humeral head compared to glenoid. But again, to get your eye in, let's look at another one. So his right shoulder, he's um, coming from behind. So coming from behind, here's the glenoid that sort of see, there's the humeral head, there's space here. There's a lot of the blood clots sort of sitting in here because it looks speckly. And then I've, I've reduced it and now it lines up better. There's that S or C shaped glenoid and there's the humeral head. So joint space is sitting there. There was the joint space here before. And again, another one, really nice example of, a, of, of the hem arthrosis, the blood in the joint space. So this is dislocated on my side. Again, the right shoulder, the glenoid sort of sitting here, or it might be that one it is sitting in this area. Here's the humeral head down here. And then we've got the humeral head here and then the sort of flat, um, C or S of the, of the uh, glenoid there, the humeral head and then the joint space. Again, lining up much better than before. It's over a centimetre difference and there's that sort of blood in the, in the joint space. Uh, and last one is an example. Uh, again, they all seem to be right shoulders for some reason. <laughs> um, and again, here's the glenoid sort of sitting up here. Here's the joint space where the shoulder used to be, hum curved humeral head here, away from the probe because it's an another example of anterior dislocation. And I've reduced it and you can see it lines up much better. Um, in, in fact, you know, as I said, the normal shoulder is slightly posteriorly placed. Um, and this was um, one that actually um, dislocated. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time, but we're almost there. Um, a young male that actually had dislocated his right shoulder spontaneously um, came in and I was really tied up with a couple of our patients. I just couldn't leave. We were a bit sort of understaffed compared to the number of patients. It took me about half an hour to get to him. He had some analgesia while I was waiting, but I said, oh, I'll just, I'll get to you. I said to him, I'll get you as soon as I can, but I just got other things that a couple of patients are more important at the moment. And then I sort of looked at him from across the desk about 20 minutes in, and he looked very, very comfortable. And so I thought, oh, maybe it's actually gone back in. And then I, I, initially I did have a feel, of, a quick feel of the shoulder and I was, I was sure it was out. Um, and then when I, 20 minutes later, I went back, he looked more comfortable. I said, that looks like it's back in now. So I put the ultrasound on and, um, and I yep, it's back in. So here's the glenoid. Again, it was a right shoulder. <laughs> Everything's the right shoulder. Um, there's a glenoid and there's the head and you can see it's lining up very well, joint space there. Um, and uh, this was a posterior dislocation. Very rare, as I said, about one in a hundred. And she, she had a spontaneous dislocation. She'd had four previous dislocations of the same shoulder. And um, this is an example of a posterior dislocation. This was the left shoulder this time, finally. So here's the um, glenoid. Uh, sorry, where are we? Glenoid here, sorry. And uh, humeral head here. Um, so you can see it sort of moved closer to the probe. And then we've done a reduction. She's feeling a lot better. You might say that the distance looks about the same as here, but actually look at the depth. The depth is different. So I've actually reduced it from two centimeters this way compared to the glenoid to about 0.75 centimeters now. And that centimeter, centimeter and a half movement made it back to normal. Um, and lastly, procedures and a couple of quick examples here. What can you replace with, um, can you replace what you used to do with x-ray? Now, in the past, you know, or it, it, your current practice may be, okay, when you put a tube in, you want to x-ray it when the patient, when you get the opportunity to make sure you haven't put the tube down too far. Um, if you then, if you've intubated a patient, you're usually gonna have to put a nasogastric down as well. Um, and again, you know, x-raying it to make sure the nasogastric's in the right place in the stomach and not elsewhere. Um, and, then, and also, you know, the other common example would be like a neck central line. Um, have you got it, you know, in the right spot, the tip of that central line, making sure that, you know, you accidentally haven't accidentally punctured the lung. Uh, more, more prone, obviously, with a sub, subclavian CBC than an internal jugular. And also the situation uh, in radiology does this as well, still where, you know, if you're doing a pleural tap, <laughs> probably one of those diagnostic pleural taps based on a chest X-ray that I've just uh, given you a few examples of, where you might potentially cause a pneumothorax. So routinely, you know, anyone having a sort of a elective, semi-elective pleural tap is getting an X-ray afterwards to, you know, look at the reduction in volume of the fluid and also make sure there's no pneumothorax. I don't have examples of the last three sort of things, but they're logical. You know how to do that. You know how to look for a pneumothorax if you know how to do a fast, you know, and you can, um, you can actually assess the CBC catheter position 
um, by doing two things. Uh, you can visualize it if you put it in too far in the uh, right atrium. And the other thing you can do is you can flush 50 mils of saline down it and um, the time between when you do the flush and when you see the turbulence in the right side of the heart tells you how close it is to the heart. So you can actually time it to make sure it's in the right spot. Um, just the last two slides, this was that same patient that had the hemopericardium that I showed you earlier. Now at one, when he was intubated, which was after draining that 200 mils of blood, so we drained the 200 mils of blood because that was the most urgent thing to fix. And then we, you know, we're bagging him asking, and then we intubated him when we got his output back. But it, we were a bit worried that maybe he'd, um, he had, uh, the tube was in the wrong place in his esophagus because the, the um, end total CO2 was low. And my first step was I looked for lung sliding on the ultrasound. I don't have you the pictures of that, but there was no lung sliding on either lung. So that's very concerning that, you know, that, that, that the tube is in the esophagus rather than in the airway. And then I thought I'll go to the neck as the next step just to make sure. Um, and uh, this is an exact classic example of having the tube in the esophagus. So um, uh, this is the linear probe, the probe marker as per convention with the, you know, to the patient's right, um, doesn't really matter. I had it on lung preset. It's not gonna matter a lot what preset you have it on. You wanna try and have the, um, the right half of the probe so the probe marker side of the probe over the um, over the you know upper trachea, and um, so we're seeing that there. And the trachea is full of air, so you're going to get a shadow behind it. But you should only get one shadow if you're in the right spot. Two shadows is bad. This is bad. We can see two shadows. Um, so what's happened is the tube's gone into the esophagus. In 98% of people, the esophagus is to the left of the midline. So we're on the left side here. Here's the esophagus. The tube is sitting in the esophagus. Again, you can't see the posterior wall of the tube because it's full of air, but there's a second shadow. And in fact, in, you can see, see it flicker. That's when the, the squeeze of air is coming down that tube. So it's a little flickering every time he's being ventilated. So we pulled the tube out and re-intubated. We were in the wrong spot. On the other hand, this is a different patient. If you put a nasogastric in deliberately, <laughs> so the previous patient had a non-deliberate nasogastric tube, which was his endotracheal tube. Um, this one, we deliberately placed the nasogastric tube. We wanted to know that it's in the esophagus where we wanted it and not in the airway. The reason we're doing that is he, um, she had a small bowel obstruction. Um, but the purpose is to just show you the procedural ultrasound. So again, here's the trachea, um, sort of on the on the right half of the picture uh, of the patient. Um, the probe marker side um, is to the patient's right. So trachea, shadow behind it. There should be a esophagus sitting here, here next to it. Um, it'll be just in front of the transverse process, which is superficial transverse process, which is sitting there. And you can see, in normally you wouldn't see any shadowing at all because it would be collapsed. The esophagus would be collapsed. And uh, there would just be the one shadow, but you can see there's a bright reflector in it, which is the nasogastric tube and it's and an air shadow behind it. So we can prove that the nasogastric is in the esophagus. So the first one, these are both instruments in the esophagus. The first one was the ETT, which we didn't want in there. And the second one is the nasogastric that we did want in there. Um, so that's it. Thanks, Any Alan. questions? No one have any questions. I, I thanks, Alan. That's the very first time ever that I've ever been able to see the bat sign on a lung ultrasound. I've been looking for the bats, and I've never been able to see it before. And I only saw it on one of your pictures, but uh, I did see a bat today. Maybe I was squinting just right. <laughs> it's been elusive. Um, the other thing you can do with the airways is a good party trick. Is um, get a fizzy drink uh, and with a straw and as you're scanning the trachea um, you can drink the fizzy drink and watch the bubbles in the esophagus to figure out you know where's your esophagus in relation to the trachea and to help you sort of sort out what your anatomy is um, it's a lot of fun too but anyway yeah just be aware there's two percent of patients where unfortunately anatomically the esophagus sits perfectly behind the trachea so the, you know, two shadows is bad. One shadow is good trick isn't going to work for those patients. But, you know, uh, lung sliding, they should have it. 
you know, if you're tubing the patient and you're in the right spot, even if you put it down too far into one lung, you'll at least see lung sliding in one lung. So I would actually use the lung sliding first. Um, the only time that you're going to be in the airway and have no lung sliding on both sides is in the situation of a bilateral um, pneumothorax. Um, and, um, you know, A, that's very rare, and B, it's usually in a setting of tensioning, uh, you know, that you've tubed the patient, they've had a cardiac arrest, and, uh, and if you've got um, bilateral tension pneumothoraces with a tube in the airway, they will be very hard to bag. Um, if they're easy to bag, then it's not bilateral tension pneumothoraces. Now, does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much, Alan. I, I love some of your, um, your lung cases there are really cool. Yeah. So I think the really... two, if, you, if you're going to take anything away from this presentation, the two things, the two big things that I think uh, I would like you to take away is ultrasound, sternal fracture or query sternal fracture equals ultrasound. It doesn't equal anything else. Yeah. Um, and the second thing is don't do taps. Don't do plural taps on the basis of a chest X-ray. You must have either an ultrasound or a CT. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for your time tonight and sharing your wonderful cases. It's been... Um, Gave you a break, Sue Ann. Yeah, it did. Thank you very much. <laughs> you um, needed it at the moment. <laughs> you yeah. got enough on your plate. Well, I... Yeah, the disasters were easing off today. The lights came back on. So that was uh, one good thing. We'll take what we can. <laughs> we're just hoping that we can have a whole week I mean, I'd like a couple of months, but a whole week where we can stay open and just run our courses with no um, disasters. But uh, hey. As Mike said, it's just the locusts and then you've been through all the biblical disasters. <laughs> it's, that, it's that. Anyway, thanks so much, Alan. I really appreciate it. And um, it's good to see you and Adib on the line. Um, hopefully see you again. If you've got ideas for our next coaching corner, just um, either tweet it to me on twitter at i underscore c underscore sound or at zdo now and or you can send me an email and, and how uh, do they find that shoulder dislocation talk if they're oh, interested on, on our uh web page under the resources there's a drop down menu that says coaching corner and the whole back catalog of our coaching corners is on there and you can find the um shoulder dislocation one among others at that spot Great. <laughs> thanks so much all right, until next time, happy scanning, everyone. All the best, everyone.